Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. As we now enter into the contemplation of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ and meditate on the salvation of the world through his sufferings, death, and burial, and resurrection, we pray. Everlasting God, in your endless love for the human race, you sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take on our nature and to suffer death on the cross. In your mercy, enable us to share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may sit. Good morning. Good morning. Well, if you remember last week, I promised you that our story was going to continue. So, does so anybody remember how we started out last week? Jordan, do you remember what I had? I had something in a bag. Acorns. They were acorns, that's right. And we started with some pictures. It looked like this, of acorns. And then we talked about how acorns change when they fall off the tree. Um, they don't, we don't have an acorn attached to the bottom of an oak tree, right? No. No, there are roots attached to the bottom of the oak tree. And then branches come out, and we talked about how Jesus talked about the change that he, might, that he was going to go through. And that's what this week is kind of all about. We've got the procession that we just did today was for what kind of Sunday? Palm Sunday. And people had palms, and they put them down on the ground. Jesus found a colt or had his disciples find a colt that had never been ridden before, and he came into town. And just like we did, walking into the church, singing Hosanna, people shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, to celebrate Jesus. And then on, uh, on Thursday of that week, we celebrated on Thursday. We call it Maundy Thursday. There was a special meal with wine and bread, and Jesus gave it to his disciples. The bread, he said, this is my body. The wine, he said, this is my blood given for you. And then the next day, the um, people at, said, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus changed from being alive to not being alive. And then next week is Easter. And Pastor Ken is going to tell you about the wonderful new life that came on Easter next week. This week... This week, to help us remember, all, some of you saw these in Sunday school already, but um, to help you remember next week, we have a Holy Week passport, starting with Palm Sunday, and then going to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prayed, and then having the la the having um, Monday Thursday, and finally, um, Easter at the very end. So this is a way you can keep track this week of all the special things that happened during Holy Week. Jordan? It wasn't Jesus that God hanged on the cross. It was God. 
Well, and we believe that God is Jesus and the Holy Spirit, three in one. Thank you. All right, let's say a prayer together. Dear God, we thank you for your life that you were that you gave your life for us. We thank you for this week of remembrance. Amen.
Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard. And she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city. And a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house. The teacher asks, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city, and found everything as he had told them and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him, one after another, Surely not. He said to them, It is one of the twelve. One who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, 
And after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny it. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep away. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come to the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See? My betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd of swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given him a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi! kissed him. <coughs> then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. <clears throat> a certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple. And in three days I will build another, not made with hands. But 
Even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, to strike him, saying to him, God's son. The guards also took him over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out to the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began saying to the began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. Again, he denied it. Then, after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowds to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, But what do you wish me to do with the man who called the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more. Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. And the soldiers led him to the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed, and spat on him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify.
They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, You saved others, you cannot save yourself. Let them decide. crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking out from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him. evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate wondered if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise
can change a person so radically? I asked that question of my faith formation group this morning as we talked about Saul, Paul. By the way, is not a story of he stops being Saul and starts being Paul. It's the same name, Hebrew and Greek. And we talked about how Saul goes from being incredibly excited to uphold the status quo of his people then turns around uh, and works often against the very progress he thought he had been making. What causes someone to change so dramatically? Mm -hmm. I think of that tendency as well when I think about the person we commemorate today on our calendar. Because today is not only the beginning of only Sunday of the Passion, it's not only Palm Sunday, it's also a commemoration of Oscar Arnulfo Romero, Archbishop of San Salvador, martyr, who was assassinated in 1980. You would not have known that would have been the end in store for Romero if you knew him as a child. He was born in 1917 in Ciudad Barrios, the mountains of El Salvador, near the border of Honduras. He left school at 12 and began an apprenticeship as a carpenter. He showed promise as a craftsman, but while still very young, he went to seminary. He trained at San Miguel in San Salvador and in Rome. He was ordained a priest in 1942. He returned to his home country of El Salvador in 1944 and served as a priest before becoming a rector at the Interdiocesan Seminary of San Salvador. In 1946, he became secretary of the Bishop's Conference of El Salvador and remained in this post for 23 years. He was consecrated bishop in 1970 and served as assistant to the aging Archbishop of San Salvador. In 1974, when he was made bishop of Santiago de Maria, and then Archbishop of San Salvador in 1977, there was growing unrest in the country because of social injustices and widespread poverty. The country was embroiled in civil war. One of the reasons Romero was elected Archbishop is because his church perceived him as someone who wouldn't rock the boat or upset the status quo, who would continue to lead the church the way it had always been led, wouldn't cause a scene, wouldn't get into trouble. Until then, he had shown every indication that that was the kind of man, priest, and bishop he was going to be. But he had barely begun his work as archbishop when two of his priests were murdered. Romero demanded an inquiry into the events and then set up a permanent commission for the defense of human rights. This was not what was expected of Archbishop Romero. And accusations and attacks continued even from within the church. Nevertheless, he continued to condemn all forms of what he called the mysticism of violence. And though he would have denied the claim at the time, he became one of the forerunning voices of liberation theology in El Salvador. He was known popularly among his people, not only the church, but his country, for his near-weekly radio addresses to his people, calling for an end to violence, not only from paramilitary groups, but his own government. The evening of March 24th, 1980, he was celebrating Mass in the small chapel of the Hospital of Divine Providence, which had been his home since his enthronement as Archbishop. He finished his homily, stepped toward the altar to prepare for the, for the celebration of the Eucharist, and as he was about to elevate the bread and wine at the offertory, a car pulled up to the chapel, a man got out, and Oscar Arnulfo Romero was shot through the heart. Just minutes before, he had said in his sermon, 
Those who surrender to the service of the poor through love of Christ will live like the grain of wheat that dies. It only apparently dies. And if it were not to die, it would remain a solitary grain. The harvest comes because of the grain that dies. We know that every effort to improve society, above all when society is so full of injustice and sin, is an effort that God blesses, that God wants, that God demands of us. Those were some of the last words he ever spoke. And aware that his life was in danger, he had already announced previously, you may say, if they succeed in killing me, that I pardon and bless those who do. Would, indeed, they might be convinced not to waste their time. A bishop will die. But God's church, which is the people, will never perish. No one was ever charged with the assassination Archbishop Oscar Arnulfo Romero. Though it is widely believed that it was his own government that ordered his death. By the time he was martyred, Romero was not the same man he was when he was ordained and when he was consecrated as bishop. By the time of his death in Rome, Paul was no longer the same man that he was. And he grew up absorbing and being immersed in the culture and the scriptures of his people. Both of these men had changed radically. But they were not the only ones who had changed. Not everyone had changed for the better. What does it take for someone to be able murder another in cold blood? What kind of change has to happen in order for someone to justify that action? One of the things that must happen is one has to dehumanize the other. It is hard to kill a fellow human being made in the image of God. It is much easier to kill an animal. It is much easier to slay a demon. And so in order to kill another human being, you must often remove their humanity from them, replace it with something else, which makes it easier to kill them. The same dehumanization Jesus also endured and suffered. He was beaten by police, condemned in a mock trial, tortured again by soldiers, and finally executed in a cruel and painful way. When Joseph of Arimathea goes to ask for Jesus' body, and Pilate asks, is he already dead? It's because crucifixion usually took a very long time. And Pilate was surprised that it would have been over. But this removal of Jesus' humanity had an unexpected consequence. When those who killed Paul, who killed Romero, removed his humanity, they were able to replace it with something lesser. But removing Jesus' humanity, and you're left with something extraordinary, something different, something else, the Son of God. God incarnate. See, we usually remove someone's humanity to lower them. When they removed Jesus' humanity and hung him on a cross, they raised him up. Because they raised him up, because they removed his humanity from him, he was able to take it back. Even though, being God, he had taken the form of a servant, became obedient even to the point of death. 
But in doing so, God raised him up, brought new life, just like that seed in the ground that Romero preached about minutes before his execution. When they tried to demean and demonize and remove Jesus, what they found changed them too. It was no small feat that the centurion at the cross is the first person after Jesus' death to proclaim, truly, this man was God's son. Because you can't remove the humanity from God any longer. You can't demonize Jesus. Oh, you can certainly try. And we certainly have. When we try that with God, the results and the consequences are unexpected, surprising, joyful, and hopeful. What causes someone to change that dramatically? What causes such a change from death to life, from sorrow to joy? What causes question we will wrestle with for the rest of this week. Even as today, we bounce back and forth from joy and hope to sorrow and grief. We know, we know the end of the story. And we know what is coming. It's the journey there that gives us. What changes a person? Only thing that ever will.
the whole church of every time and every place, we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, Father and Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and the world of human. <coughs> Blessed one, today the church sings glad hosannas as we enter holy. Prepare us to bear witness to Christ's suffering and death endured for our sake. Gather your people around the cross and comfort us with resurrection hope. Hear us, O God. Renew your good creation and protect the balance of life on earth. Encourage the work of foresters, scientists, arborists, gardeners, and river keepers. We pray for the health of pollinating insects, songbirds, and native plants. Hear us, O God. Establish peace and the justice among the nations. Hold to account any with authority to judge others. Grant that courts, legislatures, and local governments will serve with integrity and compassion. Hear us, O God. Bring hope to any who feel forsaken or forgotten. Make a way for refugees and asylum seekers. Reunite families enduring separation. We pray for any who are incarcerated institutionalized, or in foster care, that they may know your love. Hear us, O God. <laughs> Strengthen and lift up with your hand any who are suffering. Heal those who are brokenhearted, and strengthen the weak and all in need, especially Walter, Roger, Bob, Juanita, Ken, John, Todd, Chris, Steve, Melanie, <coughs> Rick, Betty, Eric, Sam, Adam, Kurt, Debbie, Heather, Jeremiah, Rich, David, Robin, Steve, Barry, Kristen, Jeannie, Marvin, Becky, Stacy, Rosie, Judy, Lori, George, Dita, Joseph, Brooke, Varner, Jane, Jim, Linda, Wayne, Michelle, Edmund, Judy, Wendy, our friends at Wilderwood, and others we now name aloud. Hear us, O God. Give energy and joy to pastors, deacons, worship leaders, and musicians. Bless baptismal candidates, their sponsors, confirmants, and teachers. Watch over those who travel. Hear us, O God. Heavenly Father, shepherd of your people, we thank you for your servant, Oscar Arnulfo Romero, who was faithful in the care and nurture of your flock. We pray that Following his example of the way of the cross and the teaching of his holy life, we may, by your grace, attain our full maturity in Christ. Hear us, O God. 
and the mercy of your faith. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. You may stand. Let us pray. Compassionate God, we offer you these gifts as signs of our time and labor. Receive the offering of our lives and feed us with your grace that in the midst of death 
all creation might feast on your unending life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, whose suffering and death gave salvation to all. You gather your people around the tree of the cross, transforming death into life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body given for you do this for the remembrance of me again after supper he took the cup gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, Come to this table, eat, drink, and be changed in hope.
You may stand. The body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of our ancestors, God of all people, before whose face the human generations pass away, we thank you that as the broken bread was gathered into one loaf, the broken fragments of our history are gathered up and healed by the redeeming act of Christ. Send us forth in peace. Form us into what we celebrate, the body of Christ in the world. Nourished by this sacrament, give us strength and courage to serve you in daily life with joy and singleness of heart. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Gracious God, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, assist those who set forth to share your word and sacrament with those who are sick, homebound, and imprisoned. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those who will receive this sacrament, and give us all the comfort of your abiding presence through the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. People of God, you have been called to be disciples of Christ. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. day in Holy Week. You'll find a schedule for the remainder of the week in the bulletin, on our Facebook page, in the blaze. Um, please note that all of the services are unique with their own unique parts that only ever happen at this time of year. So I encourage you, if at all possible, to be part of worship on as many of those days as you can. Go in peace. Remember those who are poor. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.